This lecture is part of a series of lectures for RAD229 MRI Signals and Sequences offered in the Department of Radiology at Stanford University. The ninth lecture on gradient echo sequences is divided into four parts. Lecture 9a covers balanced SSFP dynamics. The learning objectives for this sub-lecture are to explain the geometric derivation of balanced SSFP dynamics, to describe characteristics of the balanced SSFP signal versus frequency, to explain phase cycling and why it is useful. In these lectures, we will be looking at short TR gradient echo sequences. These sequences represent a rapid and efficient method for 2D and 3D imaging. These often offer high resolution with minimal blurring. It's important to look at steady states and equilibrium. And here are some examples of steady states that are analogous to what we will look at with these sequences. So imagine pushing a swing, which has friction, heating a room, which has a window open, and similarly, exciting magnetization with relaxation. And what is important here is that all of these have a driving function, but also have some loss in the system. The loss in MRI is what makes the system stable. Briefly, gradient echo sequences often refer to sequences where there is no spin echo. We will look at spoiling types, and this refers to what is done at the end of the sequence, shown here by the question mark. And indeed, what you do here can affect the contrast dramatically. These images are all acquired with identical sequences, and the only difference is what is done at the end of the sequence. So we will look at these different methods and their properties. We begin with balanced steady state free precession, or BSSFP. This is a sequence which, as the name suggests, has fully balanced gradients. You notice that over one repetition, the gradients will integrate to zero on all three axes. In this case, we can actually ignore the effect of the gradients on the signal evolution. So now let's look at a question. If we were to take the magnetization with no gradients and simply flip it by 60 degrees, alternating the sign of the flip, what do you think will happen here? To answer this, these questions, think about a few concepts here. First of all, over a short TR, typically 5 to 10 milliseconds, the relaxation is quite small. The magnetization is tipped back and forth by 60 degrees, and there should be some symmetry in the system. And it's reasonable to assume that the magnetization will end up going back and forth by plus minus 30 degrees from the MZ axis. But at this point, it's difficult to say much about the length. So this is an example of just using some intuition to try to guess what the magnetization dynamics will be. And in some cases, this is workable. So let's look at this example and see what happens. Now here we will look at three different initial states. And we have the excitation and we have relaxation. We have no precession in these examples. So watch the magnetization as we tip it, starting from three different places. So what you see is the magnetization is evolving here. What you also start to see is that it's evolving towards the same steady state. And regardless of that initial condition, it's going to reach the same unique periodic steady state. However, the transient paths differ, and these are based on the initial state. So let's look now at a simple case where there is no precession, and here we're tipping back and forth by 40 degrees or minus 40 degrees. So similarly, we look from point A to B, we rotate the magnetization. From point B to C, there's a small amount of longitudinal and transverse relaxation, as shown by the dashed yellow arrows. And in fact, we can express the amount of uh, of relaxation in both directions here, easily using the block equation here. 
Next, we will rotate the magnetization back to point D, and then the same relaxation will happen. So there's a bit of an intuition that you can apply here that because the TR is very short, the relaxation should not really affect the direction very much. And therefore the RF rotations must more or less balance each other. So let's look at some animation examples of this case. So here we are tipping magnetization back and forth by 40 degrees. And what we're showing you is the steady state. So this is with no precession. And we're looking along the MY axis and down onto the transverse plane. And we just see the magnetization flipping back and forth. So now if we add a little bit of off resonance precession, notice what happens. The magnetization flips back and forth and has a small amount of precession in between. But again, there's a somewhat of a symmetry of the steady state here of what's happening. And if you think about it, this makes some sense that essentially the precession and the rotation are more or less balancing each other and relaxation is not changing things very much. So we can look at this for multiple amounts of precession and you see the effect again. And you see that for different amounts of precession now, the steady state is actually different. So let's look at a whole group of these spins. And it starts to look a little more complicated as the spins precess and are tipped by the RF pulses. What you do notice is that they're tipped back and forth by the RF pulses between two planes. And in fact, we can simplify this system considerably by considering this ellipsoid shape and these two planes separated by the flip angle alpha here. And in fact, if we look from the bottom up at these spins, the precession is actually on the surface of this ellipsoid. And we'll explain this in a second. So now we can dim away the ellipsoid and you can see that the magnetization really is following the surface of that ellipsoid and flipping back and forth between these two planes. So let's look at a solution for unresonance magnetization, and I'll try to explain this. The idea that the relaxation does not change the length can be expressed that the dot product of the change of magnetization with the magnetization itself is zero. We know these terms from the Bloch equation, and we can substitute in what the change of magnetization is, and we have this equation, this equation shown in orange here. Now, if we multiply through by T1, um, we can rearrange this equation here and look at the form of this equation. It essentially is an ellipse uh, with eccentricity square root T2 over T1. And the width due to this is M0 over 2 times the square root of T2 over T1. We'll see that the intersection of this ellipse will be based on the flip angle and this is actually the origin of the T2 over T1 contrast that we will see with this sequence. So again, we're tipping magnetization back and forth. The change of magnetization over time is perpendicular to the magnetization itself. Here are the ellipsoid solutions. Notice that if we have a small T2 over T1, this corresponds to a, an elongated ellipse. And in the limiting case, when T2 equals e T1, this is a circle. But remember, T2 is always less than T1. So the width of this ellipse is m0 times the square root T2 over T1, and the height is m0. Remember, we flip the magnetization back and forth by the flip angle alpha, and therefore the points where the magnetization intersects this ellipse will be the point, will, will give you the length solution for the magnetization. So now let's look at signal levels. So with no off resonance and T1 equals T2, what is the transverse magnetization signal for a flip angle of, alpha of 90 degrees? So remember from what I said that if T1 equals T2, you have the circular distribution, and now you just have to find where a flip angle of 90 degrees intersects this circle. So essentially we can see this and it's uh, quite clear that a 90 degree flip angle will hit the widest point of this circle. So therefore the signal here would be m naught over 2, which is the radius of this circle. 
Now what if the flip angle for the same T1 and T2 is just 60 degrees? Well now we can draw this like this and we can actually see using the theorem that if we have an angle through the middle of the circle, the, the angle of this is twice the angle to the edge of the circle. So this means that the signal can be expressed here as uh, 0.43 m0 using this equation. So let's look a bit more at this idea of balancing the different effects. In particular, the fact that balancing RF nutation and precession. So RF is balanced by relaxation and precession. The length is still relatively unchanged over TR because TR is quite short, so we can ignore relaxation for now. Here is a, a picture again of what the, the path that the magnetization is following. And essentially we have this flip angle alpha, which is rotating the magnetization or, or nutating the magnetization around the my axis. And we can express this location along x here as mz times tan of half the flip angle. Now we can also express what we call the effective flip angle beta, which is wider here um, in the mx mz plane. And we can actually see similarly that mx is equal to mz tan beta over 2. Now if we look from above, we can look at the precession, and this is similar to what we saw in the animations here, that the magnetization is precessing by an angle phi. Now, given that the cosine of phi gives the mx extent at those arrows here, we can write that, first of all, that mx is equal to mz tan beta over 2. mx is equal to mz tan beta over 2 times cosine phi over 2 at this point. And then we have this relationship that tan alpha over 2 is equal to tan beta over 2 times cosine phi over 2. So this gives you the relationship between the actual flip angle and this effective flip angle beta. So as the precession phi increases, the, the angle beta will increase and the angle beta will always be greater than the angle alpha. So we can look at this effective flip angle for uh, multiple uh, off resonances here, or phi. Again, we have the same relationship. Remember, beta is always greater than or equal to alpha. So a larger precession angle gives a larger effective flip angle and then what we can do is we can replace the flip angle alpha with the effective flip angle beta for all calculations and then do the calculation on resonance. There's a limiting case when beta equals 180 degrees that the signal actually goes to zero. So now we can take these spins that are on the surface of this ellipsoid here. And what we can do is we can plot as a function of the frequency here uh, which corresponds to that precession angle phi, we can plot the signal level here, okay? And then we can look down onto the xy plane on the bottom left and show the distribution in the xy plane. And what we see is that the signal depends on many factors, it depends on resonant frequency, the T1 and T2 relaxation times, which give the contrast, the RF flip angle and phase, and not as strongly, it depends on the TR and the TE. So let's look at the signal as a function of frequency, including the phase. So we're going to look at different parts of the signal. So remember the dynamics, that the magnetization lies on this ellipsoid and it is flipped back and forth between where these two planes intersect the ellipsoid. So we're looking from the side and then from the bottom of the ellipsoid. And because a plane cuts an ellipsoid, leaving an ellipse as well, uh, that's why the bottom picture uh, also shows ellipses. So right after the RF pulse, we have this, again, this elliptical distribution in the MX, MY plane, and we can plot the signal magnitude and the signal phase. Midway between RF pulses, the signal actually is refocused either along the positive x or the minus mx axis, and this gives us a 
phase that is flat but alternates by 180 degrees um, at certain critical points here. And then at the end of the TR, the magnetization is once again uh, has this elliptical distribution. And this can, of course, be seen by looking at, again, the picture at the left and remembering that the magnetization is going to end where those little ellipses intersect that plane. So you have this elliptical distribution of magnetization, and it turns out that you have a linear phase, and this makes sense that you have a linear phase versus frequency because the magnetization was refocused at the center. So if you go backward in the sequence, it makes sense why you have a linear phase right after the RF pulse as well. So we've sort of shown you why we have a linear phase, why the linear phase is opposite at the start and end of the sequence, given that the magnetization is refocused in the middle. So next we can look at flip angle effects. Remember that where the flip angle intersects the ellipse or ellipsoid, this is going to give us the location of the magnetization. So for a very small flip angle, like 10 degrees, you see that the, the magnetization uh, uses a large extent of this ellipse here. And what happens is actually the signal on resonance is actually not the highest signal. The highest signal always occurs when you, have the, when you hit the side of the ellipse, as long as you hit that, the outer extent of that ellipse. And that's where those peaks will occur in the frequency response shown on the bottom. As you go to a higher flip angle, now you've, you're just under the peak signal because we're not quite at the, the, the equator of that ellipse there. But as we go slightly off resonance, we reach that equator where the signal is maximized. And then for a larger flip angle, we may actually be below the equator of the ellipse and we never get above that. So in this case, the peak signal actually may be slightly lower than the peak signal we would have got with a 50 degree flip angle or a 10 degree flip angle here. So another very important characteristic of the balanced SSFP signal is what we call dark bands. So if we look at this plot of the signal as a function of frequency, for moderately high flip angles, we always have these null points where the signal drops to zero. This corresponds to the effective beta angle of 180 degrees. And because of this, these are spaced one over TR apart because this corresponds to a certain amount of precession over TR, and therefore we want to keep TR short so that we push these bands further out so that we can tolerate a greater range of frequencies. And the short TR can in some cases limit the resolution. So let's look at some image examples of balanced SSFP images. Now these are taken with different center frequencies. So if we look at these knee images, you see these areas that look almost like bite marks in the left-hand image. And these are the areas where the signal has passed through these nulls. On the right, it's actually a broader uh, point because a lot of the signal in the bone there is in that null, but also some of the signal at the, near the top right of the image here. And if you compare the two images, you can see that the null point in one image is not a null point in the other image. And that makes sense because we've acquired these with different frequencies, so we've essentially shifted this frequency response. Here is a more graphic example where you can see these uh, signal nulls cutting through the image, and they are basically signal loss regions. So one of the things that I sort of alluded to in the prior slide is the concept of phase cycling. So we can run our sequence with an alternating flip angle, or we can run it with a constant flip angle. And this is really equivalent to just shifting the resonant frequency or the center frequency of the scan. And if we do this, what we see is that the frequency response is shifted, okay? So we've basically applied, uh, it's like we've simply scanned at a different frequency and we're able to shift this frequency response. And this is quite useful. And the reason is if we look at, at a TR of five milliseconds, we can ask where are the signal nulls if the sign of the sequence is alternated? And the answer is at plus minus 100 hertz, because these bands are spaced one over TR apart. And if the sign is alternated, they're actually, it's actually centered. Now, what if the sign of alpha is constant? So now what we see is we shift these bands exactly half the, the width away. So now 
the null points will be at minus 200, 0, and 200 hertz. So we can use this, looking at this picture at the bottom, to do what are called combined acquisitions here, where we do the alternating RF, and you see how we have these, these bands. And if we combine the alternating RF with the non-alternating RF, you see that we've got rid of the single sh signal shading across the images. So this will take twice as long, and there are ways to accelerate this perhaps, but for the most part, uh, this comes at the cost of increasing the acquisition, uh, but provides this nice smooth signal. So to summarize balanced SSFP steady state dynamics, we have these pictures that you've seen that sort of show the, the dynamics of the magnetization, where the magnetization exists in the steady state on this ellipse, and the signal versus frequency response. So we have this ellipsoidal distribution, and the shape of this ellipsoid is given by T2 over T1. The path of the magnetization on this ellipse depends on both the flip angle and the precession angle per TR. And the signal ends up being very sensitive to resonant frequency, which is a real challenge for balanced SSFP because it can result in these signal shading or sort of bite marks or dark bands in the images. Now, as with many of these sequences, there are numerous names that are used, including TrueFISP, Fiesta, Balanced FFE, BASG, and True SSFP. So in MR, there are a lot of acronyms and names, and it's quite confusing. And the best way to try to address this is to try to introduce you to these names wherever possible. So the next question you might ask is, what are the mathematical descriptions of the balanced SSFP dynamics? And for this, you can watch Lecture 9b.